Section One of the Cooey Reciter by Australian, British, and American authors. Humorous, pathetic, dramatic dialect recitations and readings. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Algie Pug, John Berlinson, and Newgate Novelist. Section One. I Killed a Man at Graspan by Montague Grover The Tale of a Returned Australian Contingenter Done into Verse I killed a man at Graspan, I killed him fair in fight, And the Empire's poets and the Empire's priests Swear blind I acted right. The Empire's poets and the Empire's priests Make out my deed was fine, But they can't stop the eyes of the man I killed From staring into mine. I killed a man at Graspan, maybe I killed a score, but this one wasn't a chance shot home from a thousand yards or more. I fired at him when he'd got no show, we were only a pace apart, with a cordite scorch in his old worn coat as the bullet drilled his heart. I killed a man at Graspan, I killed him fightin' fair, we came on each other face to face, and we went at it then and there. Mine was the trigger that shifted first, his was the life that sped, and a man I'd never a quarrel with was spread on the boulders dead. I killed a man at Graspan. I watched him squirm until he raised his eyes, and they met with mine, and there they're staring still. Cut of my brother Tom, he looked, hardly more than a kid. And Christ, he was stiffen it at my feet because of the thing I did. I killed a man at Graspan, I told the camp that night, and of all the lies that ever I told, that was the poorest skite. I swore I was proud of my hand to hand, and the boar I'd chanced to pot, and all the time I gave my eyes to never a fire that shot. I killed a man at Graspan, an hour ago about, for there he lies with his staring eyes and his blood still trickling out. I know it was either him or me, I know that I killed him fair, but all the same, wherever I look, the man that I killed is there. I killed a man at Graspan, my first, and God my last, harder to dodge than my bullet is the look that his dead eyes cast. If the Empire asks for me later on, it'll ask for me in vain, before I reached my bandolier to fire on a man again. End of section Section 2 of the Cooey Reciter Kitty O'Toole by W. L. Lumley Oh, a charming young creator was Kitty O'Toole, the lily of sweet Tipperary, with a voice like a thrush, and with cheeks like a rose, and a figure as neat as a fairy. I saw her one night. Oh, she looked like a queen, in a glory of sweet one and twenty. And she said when McGinty's big arm I went to waste. Oh, how I envied McGinty. Six months after that, in the sweet summer days, the boys and the girls were invited, by Mickey O'Toole, of the cabin beyond, to see Kate and McGinty united. And when in the church they were made into a one, and the priest gave them blessing in plenty, and Kitty looked sweeter than ever before, oh, how I envied McGinty. But the years have gone by, and McGinty is dead. Oh, me heart is all broke up with pity, to see her so lonely and mournful and sad. And I went and got married to Kitty, but now, when I look where McGinty is laid, with a stone o'er his head, crude and flinty, as he lies there, so peaceful and quiet and still, oh, how I envy McGinty. End of section. Section three of the Cooey Reciter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Ballad of the Drover by Henry Lawson By kind permission of Messrs. Angus and Robertson, 
Publishers, Sydney and Melbourne. Across the stony ridges, across the rolling plain, young Harry Dale, the drover, comes riding home again, and well his stock-horse bears him, and light of heart is he, and stoutly his old pack-horse is trotting by his knee. Up Queensland way with cattle he travelled regions vast, and many months have vanished since home-folk saw him last. He hums the song of someone he hopes to marry soon, and hobble-chains and camp-ware keep jingling to the tune. Beyond the hazy dado, against the lower skies, on yon blue line of ranges the homestead station lies, and thitherward the drover jogs through the lazy noon, while hobble-chains and camp-ware are jingling to a tune. An hour has filled the heavens with storm-cloud, inky black, at times the lightning trickles around the drover's track, but Harry pushes onward, his horse's strength he tries, in hope to reach the river before the flood shall rise. The thunder from above him goes rolling o'er the plain, and down on thirsty pastures in torrents fall the rain, and every creek and gully sends forth its little flood, till the river runs a banker all stained with yellow mud. Now Harry speaks to Rover, the best dog on the plains, and to his hardy horses, and strokes their shaggy manes. We breasted bigger rivers when floods were at their height, nor shall this gutter stop us from getting home to night. The thunder growls a warning, the ghastly lightnings gleam, as the drover turns his horses to swim the fatal stream. But, oh, the flood runs stronger than e'er it ran before, the saddle horse is failing, and only halfway o'er. When flashes next the lightning, the flood's grey breast is blank, and a cattle dog and pack horse are struggling up the bank. But on the bank to northward, or on the southern shore, the stock horse and his rider will struggle out no more. The faithful dog a moment sits panting on the bank, then swims through the current to where his master sank, and round and round in circles. He fights with failing strength, till borne down by the waters, the old dog sinks at length. Across the flooded lowlands and slopes of sodden loam, the pack-horse struggles onward to take dumb tidings home, and mud-stained, wet and weary, through ranges dark goes he. The hobble-chains and tinware are sounding eerily. The floods are in the ocean, the stream is clear again, and now a verdant carpet is stretched across the plain. But someone's eyes are saddened, and someone's heart still bleeds, in sorrow for the drover who sleeps among the reeds. End of section Section 4 of The Cooey Reciter this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Rescue by Edward Dyson From Rhymes from the Mines By kind permission of Messrs. Angus and Robertson Publishers, Sydney and Melbourne There's a sudden fierce clang of the knocker Then the sound of a voice in the shaft Shrieking words that drum hard on the centres And the braceman goes suddenly daft Set the whistle a blowin' like blazes Billy, run, give old Mackie a call. Run, you fool, number two's gone to pieces, and Fred Baker is caught in the fall. Say, hello, there below, any hope, boys? Any chances of saving his life? Either way, says the knocker, they've started. God be praised, he's no youngsters or wife. Screams the whistle in fearful entreaty, and the wild echo raves on the spur, and the night that was still as a sleeper in soft charm sleep is astir, with the fluttering of wings in the wattles and the vague frightened murmur of birds, with far cooees that carry the warning running feet in articulate words. From the black belt of bush come the miners, and they gather by Mac on the brace, out of breath barely clad and half wakened, with a question in every face. Who's below? Where's a fall? Didn't I tell you? Didn't I say them sets wasn't sound? Is it Fred? He was reckless, was Baker? 
now he's seen his last shift underground and his mate where is sandy mcfaden sandy snoring at home on his bunk not at work name of god a foreboding a foreboding be hanged he is drunk take em steady there lads the boss orders he is white to the roots of his hair we may get him alive before daybreak if he's close to the face and has air in the dim drive with ardour heroic two facemen are pegging away long and coots in the rise heard her thunder and they fled without word or delay down the drive and they rushed for the ladders and they went up the shaft with a run for they knew the weak spot in the workings and they guessed there was graft to be done number two was pitch dark and they scrambled to the plat and they made for the face but the roof had come down fifty yards in and the reef was all over the place fresher men from the surface replaced them and they're hauled up on top for a blow when a life and death job is in doing there's room only for workers below bare armed and bare chested and brawny with a grim meaning set of the jaw the relay hurries in to the rescue not caring for the danger a straw tis not toil but a battle they're called to and like trojans the miners respond for a dead man lies crushed neath the timbers or a live man is choking beyond by the faint yellow glow of the candles where the dank drive is hot with their breath on the verge of the land of the shadow waging war breast to bosom with death how they struggle these giants and slowly as the trucks rattle into the gloom inch by inch they advance to the conquest of a prison or is it a tomb and the workings re-echo a volley as the timbers are driven in place then a whisper is borne to the toilers boys his mother is there on the brace like veterans late into action fierce with longing to hew and to hack reared and shift rushes in to relieve them and the toil-stricken men stagger back stow the stuff mates wherever the stowage run the man on the brace till he drops there's no time to think on this billet bark the heels of the trucker who stops keep the props well in front and be careful he's in there and alive never fret but the grey dawn is softening the ridges and the word has not come to us yet till the knocker rings out and the engine shrieks and strains like a creature in pain as the cage rushes up to the surface and drops back into darkness again by the capstan a woman is crouching in her eyes neither hope nor despair but a yearning that glowers like frenzy bids those who'd speak pity forbear like a figure in stone she is seated till the labour of rescue be done for the father was killed in the phoenix and the son lord of pity the son hello there on top they are calling they are through he is seen in the drive they have got him thank heaven they've got him and oh blessed be god he's alive man on heave away step aside lads let his mother be first when he lands she was silent and strong in her anguish now she babbles and weeps where she stands and the stern men grown gentle support her at the mouth of the shaft till at last with a rush the cage springs to the landing and her son's arms encircle her fast she has cursed the old mind for its murders for the victims its drives have ensnared now she cries a great blessing upon it for the one precious life it has spared end of section Section 5 of the Cooey Reciter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Saltbush Bill by A. B. Patterson. By permission of Messrs. Angus and Robertson, Publishers, Sydney and Melbourne. Now, this is the law of the overland that all in the West obey. A man must cover with travelling sheep a six mile stage a day. But this is the law which the drovers make right easily understood they travel their stage where the grass is bad but they camp where the grass is good they camp and they ravage the squatter's grass till never a blade remains then they drift away as the white clouds drift on the edge of the salt bush plains 
From camp to camp, and from run to run, they battle it hand to hand, for a blade of grass and the right to pass on the track of the overland. For this is the law of the great stock routes, tis written in white and black, the man that goes with a travelling mob must keep to a half-mile track, and the drovers keep to a half-mile track on the runs where the grass is dead. But they spread their sheep on a well-grassed run till they go with a two-mile spread. So the squatters hurry the drovers on from dawn till the fall of night, and the squatters' dogs and the drovers' dogs get mixed in a deadly fight. Yet the squatters' men, though they hunt the mob, are willing the peace to keep, for the drovers learn how to use their hands when they go with the travelling sheep. But this is a tale of a jackaroo that came from a foreign strand, and the fight that he fought with Saltbush Bill, the king of the overland. Now Saltbush Bill was a drover tough, as ever the country knew. He had fought his way on the great stock routes from the sea to the big Baku. He could tell when he came to a friendly run that gave him a chance to spread, and he knew where the hungry owners were that hurried his sheep ahead. He was drifting down in the eighty drought with a mob that could scarcely creep, when the kangaroos by the thousands starve, it is rough on the travelling sheep. And he camped one night at the crossing place on the edge of the Wilga run. We must manage a feed for them here, he said, or the half of the mob are done. So he spread them out when they left the camp wherever they liked to go, till he grew aware of a jackaroo with a station hand in tow. And they set to work on the straggling sheep, and with many a stock whip crack, they forced them in where the grass was dead in the space of the half-mile track. So William prayed that the hand of fate might suddenly strike him blue, but he get some grass for his starving sheep in the teeth of that jackaroo. So he turned and he cursed the jackaroo, he cursed him, alive or dead, from the soles of his great unwieldy feet to the crown of his ugly head, with an extra curse on the moky road and the cur at his heels that ran till the jackaroo from his horse got down, and he went for the drover man. With the station hand for his picker up, though the sheep ran loose the while, they battled it out on the saltbush plain in the regular prize-ring style. Now the new chum fought for his honour's sake and the pride of the English race, but the drover fought for his daily bread with a smile on his bearded face. So he shifted ground and he sparred for wind, and he made it a lengthy mill, and from time to time, as his scouts came in, they whispered to Saltbush Bill, We have spread the sheep with a two-mile spread, and the grass it is something grand. You must stick to him, Bill, for another round, for the pride of the overland. The new chum made it a rushing fight, though never a blow got home, till the sun rode high in the cloudless sky, and glared on the brick-red loam, till the sheep drew into the shelter trees, and settled them down to rest. Then the drover said he would fight no more, and he gave his opponent best. So the new chum rode to the homestead straight, and he told them a story grand of the desperate fight that he fought that day with the king of the overland. And the tale went home to the public schools of the pluck of the English swell, how the drover fought for his very life, but blood in the end must tell. But the travelling sheep and the Wilga sheep were boxed on the old man plain, was a full week's work ere they drafted out and hunted them off again. With a good week's grass in their wretched hides, with a curse and a stock whip crack, they hunted them off on the road once more to starve on the half-mile track. And Saltbush Bill on the overland, or many a time recite, how the best day's work that he ever did was the day that he lost the fight. End of section Section 6 of the Cooey Reciter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Drought and Doctrine by J. Brunton Stevens. By kind permission of the publishers, Messrs. Angus and Robertson, Sydney and Melbourne. Come, take the tenor, Doctor. Yes, I know the bill says five, but it ain't as if you merely kept our little one alive. Man, you saved the mother's reason when you saved that baby's life. And it's thanks to you I hadn't a raven idiot for a wife. Let me tell you all the story, 
and if then you think it strange that i'd like to fee ye extry why i'll take the bloom and change if your bill had said a hundred i'm a poor man doc and yet i'd a slave till i had squared it ay and still been in your debt well you see the wife's got notions on a heap of things that ain't to be handled by a man as don't pretend to be a saint so i minds the cultivation smokes my pipe and makes no stir and religion had such points i lays entirely on to her no she's got it fixed within her that if children die afore they've been sprinkled by the parson they've no show for ever more and though they're spared the pitchfork the brimstone and the smoke they ain't allowed to mix up there with other little folk so when our last began to pine and lost his pretty smile and not a parson to be had within a hundred mile although there is a chapel down at bluegrass creek you know the clergy's there on duty only thrice a year or so well when our yet unchristened might grew limp and thin and pale it would have cut you to the heart to hear the mother wail about her unregenerate babe and how if it should go twould have no chance with them as had their registers to show then awful quiet she grew and hadn't spoken for a week when in came brother bill one day with news from bluegrass creek i seen says he a notice on the chapel rail and tied they'll have service there this evening can the youngster stand the ride for we can't have parson here if it be true as i've heard say there's a dying man as wants him more'n twenty mile away so he hadn't time to finish ere the child was out of bed with a shawl about its body and a hood upon its head saddle up the missus said i did her bidden like a bird perhaps i thought it foolish but i never said a word for though i have a vote in what the kids eat drink or wear their spiritual requirements are entirely her affair we started on our two hours ride beneath a burning sun with aunt sal and bill for shorties to renounce the evil one and a bottle in sal's basket that was labelled fine old tom held the water that regeneration was to follow from for bluegrass creek was dry as bill that very day had found and not a sup of water to be had for miles around so to make salvation sartin for the babby's little soul we had filled a dead marine sir at the family water hole which every forty rods or so sal raised it to her head and took a snifter just enough to wet her lips she said whereby it came to pass that when we reached the chapel door there was only what would serve the job and deuce a dribble more the service had begun we didn't like to carry in a vessel with so evident a character for gin so we left it in the porch and having done our level best went and owned to being miserable offenders with the rest and nigh upon the finish when the parson had been told that a lamb was waiting there to be admitted to the fold remembering the needful i gets up and quietly slips to the porch to see a swagsman with our bottle at his lips such a faintness came all over me you might have then and there knocked me down sir with a feather or tied me with a hair doc i couldn't speak nor move and though i caught the beggar's eye with a wink he turned the bottle bottom up and drank it dry and then he flung it from him being suddenly aware that the label on was merely a delusion and a snare and the crash cut short the people in the middle of amen and all the congregation heard him holler sold again so that christenin was a failure every water flask was drained even the monkey in the vestry not a blessed drop contained and the parson in a hurry counted off upon his mare leaving baby unregenerate and missus in despair that night the child grew worse but all my care was for the wife i feared more for her reason than for that we spark a life but you know the rest how providence contrived that very night that a doctor should come cadging at our shanty for a light baby oh he's chirpy thank ye b 
been baptised. His name is Bill. It's weeks and weeks since Parson came and put him through the mill, and his mother's mighty vain upon the subject of his weight, and regular cock a hoop about his spiritual state. So now you'll take the tenor. Oh, confound the bloomin' change. Lord, if Billy died. But, Doctor, don't you think it's somewhat strange? that them as keeps the gate would have refused to let him in because a fool mistook a drop of Adam's ale for gin. End of section Section 7 of the Cooey Reciter This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Martyr by Victor J. Daly From At Dawn and Dusk Poems by kind permission of Angus and Robertson, Publishers, Sydney and Melbourne. Not only on cross and gibbet, by sword and fire and flood, have perished the world's sad martyrs, whose names are writ in blood. A woman lay in a hovel, mean, dismal, gasping for breath. One friend alone was beside her, the name of him was Death. For the sake of her orphan children, for money to buy them food, she had slaved in the dismal hovel and wasted her womanhood. Winter and spring and summer came each with a load of cares, and autumn to her brought only a harvest of grey hairs. Far out in the blessed country, beyond the smoky town, the winds of God were blowing ever more up and down. The trees were waving signals of joy from the bush beyond, the gum its blue-green banner, the fern, its dark green frond flower called to flower in whispers by sweet caressing names and young gum shoots sprang upward like woodland altar flames and deep in the distant ranges the magpie's fluting song roused musical mocking echoes in the woods of dandenong and riders were galloping gaily with loose-held flowing reins through dim and shadowy gullies across broad treeless plains and winds through the heads came wafting a breath of life from the sea, and over the blue horizon the ships sailed silently. And out of the sea at morning the sun rose, golden bright, and in crimson and gold and purple sank in the sea at night. But in dreams alone she saw them, her hours of toil between, for life to her was only a heartless dead machine. Her heart was in the graveyard, where lay her children three. Nor work nor prayer could save them, nor tears of agony. On the lips of her last and dearest, pressing a farewell kiss, she cried aloud in her anguish, Can God make amends for this? Dull, desperate, ceaseless slaving bereft her of power to pray, and man was careless and cruel, and God was far away. But who shall measure his mercies? His ways are in the deep, and after a life of sorrow he gave her his gift of sleep. Rest comes at last to the weary, and freedom to the slave. Her tired and worn-out body sleeps well in its pauper grave. But his angel bore her soul up to that bright land and fair, where sorrow enters never, nor any cloud of care. They came to a lovely valley, a gleam with asphodel and the soul of the woman speaking said here i fain would dwell the angel answered gently o soul most pure and dear o soul most tried and truest thy dwelling is not here behold thy place appointed long hept long waiting come where bloom on the hills of heaven the roses of martyrdom end of section Section 8 of the Cooey Reciter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Carrying of the Baby by Ethel Turner. Larry had been carrying it for a long way and said it was quite time Dot took her turn. Dot was arguing the point. She reminded him of all athletic sports he had taken part in and of all the prizes he had won. She asked him, what was the use of being six foot two and an impossible number of inches round the chest if he could not carry a baby? 
Larry gave her an unexpected glance and moved the baby to his other arm. He was heated and unhappy. There seemed absolutely no end to the red, red road they were traversing, and Dot, as well as refusing to help to carry the burden, laughed aggravatingly at him when he said it was heavy. He is exactly twenty-one pounds, she said. I weighed him on the kitchen scales yesterday. I should think a man of your size ought to be able to carry twenty-one pounds without grumbling so. But he's on springs, Dot, he said. Just look at him. He's never still for a minute. You carry him to the beginning of Lee's orchard, and then I'll take him again. Dot shook her head. I'm very sorry, Larry, she said, but I really can't. You know I didn't want to bring the child, and when you insisted, I said to myself, you should carry him every inch of the way, just for your obstinacy. But you're his mother, objected Larry. He was getting seriously angry. His arms ached unutterably. His clothes were sticking to his back, and twice the baby had poked a little fat thumb in his eye and made it water. But you're its father, Dot said sweetly. It's easy for a woman to carry a child than a man. Poor Larry was mopping his hot brow with his disengaged hand. Everyone says so. Don't be a little sneak, Dot. My arm's getting awfully cramped. Here, for pity's sake, take him. Dot shook her head again. Would you have me break my vow, St. Lawrence? she said. She looked provokingly cool and unruffled as she walked along by his side. Her gown was white, with transparent puffy sleeves. Her hat was white, and very large. She had little white canvas shoes, long white suede gloves, and she carried a white parasol. "'I'm hanged,' said Larry, and he stopped short in the middle of the road. "'Look here, my good woman. Are you going to take your baby, or are you not?' Dot revolved her sunshade round her little sweet face. "'No, my good man,' she said. "'I don't propose to carry your baby one step.' "'Then I shall drop it,' said Larry. He held it up in a threatening position by the back of its crumpled coat. But Dot had gone sailing on. "'Find a soft place,' she called, looking back over her shoulder once and seeing him still standing in the road. "'Little minx,' he said under his breath. Then his mouth squared itself. Ordinarily, it was a pleasant mouth, much given to laughter and merry words. But when it took that obstinate look, one could see capabilities for all manner of things. He looked carefully around. By the roadside, there was a patch of soft green grass and a wattle bush, yellow crowned, beautiful. He laid the child down in the shade of it. He looked to see there were no ants, or other insects near. He put on the booty that was hanging by a string from the little rosy foot, and he stuck the India rubber comforter in its mouth. Then he walked quietly away and caught up to Dot. Well, she said, but she looked a little startled at his empty arms. She drooped the sunshade over the shoulder nearest to him and gave a hasty, surreptitious glance backward. Larry strode along. "'You look fearfully ugly when you screw up your mouth like that,' she said, looking up at his set side face. "'You're an unnatural mother, Dot, that's what you are,' he returned hotly. "'By Jove, if I was a woman, I'd be ashamed to act as you do. You get worse every day you live. I've kept excusing you to myself, and saying you would get wiser as you grew older, and instead you seem more childish every day.' She looked childish. She was very, very small in stature, very slightly and delicately built. Her hair was in soft gold-brown curls, as short as a boy's. Her eyes were soft and wide and tender and beautiful as a child's. When she was happy, they were the colour of that blue, deep violet we call the Tsar. And when she grew thoughtful or sorrowful, they were like the heart of a great dark purple pansy. She was not particularly beautiful, only very fresh and sweet and lovable. Larry once said she always looked like a baby 
that has been freshly bathed and dressed and puffed with sweet violet powder and sent out into the world to refresh tired eyes that was one of its courtship sayings more than a year ago when she was barely seventeen she was eighteen now and he was telling her she was an unnatural mother why the child wouldn't have had its bib on only i saw to it he said in a voice that increased in excitement as he dwelt on the enormity dear me said dot that was very careless of peggy i must really speak to her about it i shall shake you one day dot larry said shake you till your teeth rattle Ooh, sometimes i can hardly keep my hands off you his brow was gloomy his boyish face troubled vexed and dot laughed leaned against the fence skirting the road that seemed to run to eternity and laughed outrageously larry stopped too his face was very white and square looking his dark eyes held fire he put his hands on the white exaggerated shoulders of her muslin dress and turned her round go back to the bottom of the hill this instant and pick up the child and carry it up here he said go and insert your foolish old head in a receptacle for pomme de terre was dot's flippant retort larry's hands pressed harder his chin grew squarer i'm in earnest dot deadly earnest i order you to fetch the child and i intend you to obey me he gave her a little shake to enforce the command i am your master and i intend you to know it from this day dot experienced a vague feeling of surprise at the fire in the eyes that were nearly always clear and smiling and loving then she twisted herself away pooh she said you're only a stupid overgrown passionate boy larry you my master you're nothing in the world but my husband are you going he said in a tone he had never used before to her say yes or no dot instantly no said dot stormily then they both gave a sob of terror their faces blanched and they began to run madly down the hill oh the long long way they had come the endless stretch of red red road that wound back to the gold-tipped wattles the velvet grass and their baby larry was a fleet wonderful runner in the little cottage where they lived manifold silver cups and mugs bore witness to it and he was running for life now but dot nearly outstripped him she flew over the ground hardly touching it her arms were outstretched her lips moving they fell down together on their knees by their baby just as three furious hard-driven bullocks thundered by filling the air with dust and bellowing the baby was blinking happily up at a great fat golden beetle that was making a lazy way up the wattle it had lost its comforter and was sucking its thumb thoughtfully it had kicked off its white knitted boots and was curling its pink toes up in the sunshine with great enjoyment baby larry said the big fellow was trembling in every limb baby said dot she gathered it up in her little shaking arms she put her poor white face down upon it and broke into such pitiful tears and sobs that it wept too larry took them both into his arms and sat down on a fallen tree he soothed them he called them a thousand tender beautiful names he took off dot's hat and stroked her little curls he kissed his baby again and again he kissed his wife when they were all quite calm and the bullocks ten miles away they started again i'll carry him said larry ah no let me dot said darling you're too tired see you can hold his hand across my shoulder no no give him to me my arms ache without him but the hill my big baby oh i must have him larry let me see he is so light why he has nothing to carry end of section section nine of the cooey reciter this librivox recording is in the public domain the old gum by florence bullivant 
Stand here. He has once been a grand old gum. But it makes one reflect that the time will come when we all shall have had our fling. Yet our life soon passes, we scarce know how. You would hardly think to see him now that once he had been a king. In his youth, in the silence of the wood, a forest of saplings around him stood. But he overtopped them all, and over their heads, through the forest shade, he could see how the sunlight danced and played, so straight he grew and so tall. Each day of his life brought something new, the breeze stirred the bracken, the dry leaves flew, the wild bird passed on the wing. He heard the low sad song of the wood, his childhood was passed in its solitude, and he grew and became a king. Oft as he stood on the stormy night, where the long forked flash has revealed to sight the plain where the floods were out, when the wind came down like a hurricane, and the branches, broken and snapped in twain, were scattered and strewn about. Oft, touched by the reddening bushfire glow, when clouds of smoke rolling up from below, obscured the sun like a pall, when the forest seemed like a flaming sea, and down came many a mighty tree, as he stood firm through it all. Those days of his youth have long gone by, the magpie's note and the parrot's cry, as born on the evening wind, recall to his thoughts his childhood flown, old memories, fresh, yet faintly blown, of the youth he has left behind. On the brow of the hill he stands to-day, for the pride of his life has passed away, his leaves are withered and sear, and oft at night comes the sound of woe, as he sways his tired limbs to and fro, and laments to the bleak night air. He can still look down on the plain below, and his head is decked by the sunset glow with a glorious crown of light, and from every field, as the night draws on, to his spreading arms the magpies come to shelter there for the night. Some night, when the waters rage and swell, he will hear the thunder roll his knell, and will bow his head to the ground, and the birds from their nests will wheel in the air, and the rabbits burrow deeper in fear at the thundering, rending sound. And the magpies must find another home, no more at the sunset, Will they come to warble their evening song? Ah, well, our sorrow is quickly flown For the good old friends we have loved and known And the old tree falls by the tall new grown And the weak must yield to the strong. End of section Section 10 of the Cooey Reciter this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Murphy Shall Not Sing Tonight by Montague Grover Specimens of Ireland's greatness gathered round O'Connor's bar, answering the invitation Patsy posted near and far. All the chandeliers were lit, but did not shed sufficient light, so tallow candles stuck in bottles graced the bar that famous night. All the quality were there, before such talent ne'er was seen, Healy brought the house down fairly with the wearin' of the green. Liquor went round in lashins, everything was going off right, when O'Connor sent the word round, Murphy shall not sing to-night. Faces paled at Patsy's order, none were listening to the song. Through their hearts went vague sensations, awful dreads of coming wrong. For they knew that Danny Murphy thought himself a singer quite, and knew that if he made his mind up, that, bedat, he'd sing that night. Everyone was close attention, knew that there would be a row, when the chairman said that, Mr. Murphy will oblige us now. Not so fast, said Pat O'Connor, rising to his fullest height. This here pub belongs to me, and Murphy shall not sing tonight. Up jumps Murphy, scowling darkly as he looks at Pat O'Connor. Is this the way? he says to Pat. You uphold all island's honour. I know I'm not much at singing. Any time I'd sooner fight. But to show me independence, sell me, Bob. I'll sing tonight. Gentlemen, says Pat O'Connor, wildly gazing round about. 
it will be my painful duty to chuck Danny Murphy out. It has been a rule with me that no man sings when he is tight. When I see a thing, I mean it. Murphy shall not sing to-night. Then says Doolan to O'Connor, Listen, what I've got to tell. If you want to chuck out Murphy, you must chuck out me as well. This lot staggered Pat O'Connor. Doolan was a man of might, but he bluffed him loudly, crying, Murphy shall not sing to-night. Then he rushed on Danny Murphy, and he smote him hip and thigh. Patsy looked a winner straight, when Doolan jabbed him in the eye. All the crowd at once took sides, and soon began a rousing fight. The battle cry of Patsy's push was, Murphy shall not sing to-night. The noise soon brought a copper in. "'Twas Patsy's cousin, Jim Kinsella. "'Hold you row, he says to Doolan, "'when Mick lands him on the smeller. "'They got the best of Doolan's push, though, "'lumbered them for getting tight. "'Patsy then had spoken truly. "'Murphy did not sing that night.' "'Epilogue. "'Specimens of Ireland's greatness "'gathered round the city court. "'There, before the awful sentence, "'was a touching lesson taught.' Then away they led the prisoners to a cell so cool and white, and for fourteen days to come, Murphy shall not sing at night. End of section Section 11 of The Cooey Reciter This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Christmas Bells by John B. O'Hara, M.A. By kind permission of the author. Bells, joyous bells of the Christmas time, Dear is the song of your welcome chime, Dear is the burden that softly wells From your joyous throats, O tolling bells, Dear is the message sweet you bind, Dove-like to wings of the wafting wind. You tell how the Yule King cometh forth From his home in the heart of the icy north, on his eastern steeds how rusheth on the wind-god of storms, Euroclidon, how his trumpet strikes to the pallid stars that shrink from the mad moon's silver bars, where the cold wind tortures the sobbing sea, and the chill sleet pierces the pinioned lee, as the snow-king hurls from his frozen zone the fragments fast of a tumbled throne. But what is the song, O silver bells, you sing of the ferny austral dells, of the bracken height and the sylvan stream, and the breezy woodland summer dream, lulled by the lute of the slow sweet rills, in the trembling heart of the great grave hills. Ah, what is the song that you sing to me of the soft blue isles of our shimmering sea, where the slow tides sleep and a purple haze fringes the skirts of the windless bays that, ringed with a circlet of beauty fair, start in the face of the dreamer there? Oh, what is the burden of your sweet chimes, Bells of the golden Christmas times? You sing of the summer, gliding down From the stars that gem bright heaven's crown, Of the flowers that fade in the autumn sear, And the sunlit death of the old, old year, Of the sweet south wind that sobs above The grass-green grave of our buried love. No bitter dirge from the stormy flow Of a moaning sea, Ah, no, 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 but a sweet farewell, and a low soft hymn under the beautiful moons that swim over the silver seas that toss their foam to thy shrine, O Southern Cross. Oh, bright is the burden of your sweet chimes, bells of the joyous Christmas times. You bring to the old hearts throbbing slow the beautiful dreams of the long ago, remembrance sweet of the old and new, when hearts beat high in life's young school, Ah, haply now, as they list to your chimes, Will the voices rise of the olden times, Till the wings of peace brood over the hours, Slipping like streams through sleepy bowers, While you whisper the story loved Of one who suffered for us, The sad sweet son, Who taught that afflictions sent in love Chasten the soul for the realms above. End of section. Section 12 of the Cooey Reciter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Wool is Up by Garnet Walsh. 
earth o'erflows with nectared gladness all creation teems with joy banished be each thought of sadness life for me has no alloy fill a bumper drain a measure pewter goblet tankard cup testifying thus our pleasure at the news that wool is up thwart the empires neath the oceans subtly speeds the living fire who shall tell what wild emotions spring from out that thridden wire jute is lower copper weaker this will break poor neighbour jup but for me i shout eureka wealth is mine for wool is up what care i for jute or cotton sugar copper hemp or flax reeds like these are often rotten turn to rods for owners backs fortune ha i have thee holden in what scotia calls a grup all my fleeces now are golden full troy weight for wool is up i will dance the gay fandango though to me its steps be strange doubts and fears you all can hang go i will cut a dash on change atracura you will please me by dismounting from my crop purr you no more shall tease me pray get down for wool is up jane shall have that stylish bonnet which my scanty purse denied long she set her heart upon it she shall wear it now with pride i will buy old dumper's station reign as king at gearing up for my crest a bust of jason with this motto wool is up i will keep a stud extensive bolter here i'll have those greys those sir george deemed too expensive you can send them with the bays coursing i should rather think so yes i'll take that lightning pup jones my boy you needn't wink so i can stand it wool is up wifey love you're looking charming years with you are but as days we must have a grand housewarming when these painters go their ways let the ballroom be got ready bid our friends to dance and sup bother how can i go steady i'm worth thousands wool is up end of section section 13 of the cooey reciter this librivox recording is in the public domain wool is down by garnet walsh blacker than air the inky waters roll upon the gloomy shores of sluggish styx a surge of sorrow laps my leaden soul for that which was at two is now one six come disappointment come as has been said by someone else who quailed neath fortune's frown stabbed to the core the heart that once has bled for heart read pocket wool ah wool is down and in the lowest deep a lower deep thou sightless seer indeed it may be so the road too well we know is somewhat steep and who shall stay us when that road we go thrice cursed wire whose lightning strikes to blast whose babbling tongue proclaims throughout the town the news which being ill has travelled fast the dire intelligence that wool is down a rise in copper and a rise in jute a fall alone in wool but what a fall jupp must have made a pile this trip the brute he don't deserve such splendid luck at all the smiles for him for me the scalding tears he's worth ten thousand if he's worth a crown while i untimely shorn by fate's harsh shears feel that my game is up when wool is down bolter take back these prancing greys of thine remove as well the vanquished warriors bays my fortunes are not stable they decline ay even horses taunt me with their neighs and thou sweet puppy of the lightning breed through whose fleet limbs i pictured me renown high howling to thy former home with speed thy course with me is up for wool is down why jane what's this this pile of letters here such waste of stamps is really very sad 
your birthday ball oh come not twice a year good gracious me the woman must be mad you'd better save expense at once that's clear and send a bellman to invite the town there there don't cry forgive my temper dear but put these letters up for wool is down my station gearing up yes that must go its sheep its oxen and its kangaroos first twas the home of blacks then whites we know now is it but a dwelling for the blues with it i leave the brotherhood of cash who form australian fashion's tinsel crown i tread along the devious path of smash i go where wool has gone down ever down thus ends my dream of greatness not for me the silken couch the banquet and the rout they're flown the base residuum will be a mutton chop and half a pint of stout it will i hold a corner in my soul where hope may nestle safe from fortune's frown thou hoodwinked jade my heart remaineth whole i'll keep my spirits up though wool be down end of section Section 14 of the Cooey Reciter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Highland Brigade Buries Its Dead by Lieutenant Colonel W. T. Ray. By kind permission of the author. How am I to describe the sadly impressive scene at Modda River on the evening of the 13th of December? The sun has just set, and the period of twilight has commenced. The great heat of the day has passed, and although there is not a breath of wind, the air is cool and refreshing. The whole British camp at Modder River is astir. Not, however, with the always gay bustle of warlike preparations, not with the laughter and jest which, such strange creatures are we, almost invariably come from the lips of men who dress for the parade which precedes a plunge into battle. There is, this evening, a solemn hush over the camp, and the men move from their lines in irregular and noiseless parties, for the time their pipes put out of sight, and their minds charged with serious thought. To what is given this homage of silence, as the soldiers gather, and mechanically, without word of command, or even request of any kind, leave a roadway from the headquarters flag to a point a quarter of a mile away, where a dark mound of upraised earth breaks the monotonous flatness of the whitey green veldt. For these are mere spectators, deeply interested, it is true, yet still only spectators. What then is afoot? Civilians, hats off, and attention everyone. The Highland Brigade is about to bury its dead. Stand here at the head of the lines of spectator soldiers, here where that significant mound is, here at the spot selected as a last resting place and observe the whole brigade some of the regiments sadly attenuated is on parade and has formed funeral procession under colonel pole carew first come the pipers and it is seen that they have for the nonce discarded their service kit and are in the full dress of their several clans savage and shrill is the byronic description of the pibroch which in the noon of night startled the joyous revellers before waterloo now it is a low deep wail yet voluminous and weirdly euphonious that comes from the music makers of the highlands and every heart stands still to listen oh so sad it is the flowers of the forest he cometh forth like a flower and is cut down they are playing shall i say no rather does the music flow out from the very souls of the pipers in a succession of strangely harmonious moans and soul calls to soul yet beneath it all beneath the dominant note of heart-bursting sorrow lurks that other element the savage and shrill yes indeed soul calls to soul through these pipes calls for sobs and tears for the brave who have fallen, calls for vengeance on the yet unbeaten foe. The Highland Brigade is burying its dead. 
Following the pipers marches a small armed party. It would have been the firing party, but volleys are not fired over soldiers' graves in time of war. Then the chaplain, in his robes, preceding the corpse of General Walkhope, who had fallen at the head of his men, borne on a stretcher. One of the bearers is of the dead man's kin, a promising young Highland officer. Then come the several regiments of the brigade, the black watch leading. The men march with arms reversed, stately, erect, stern, grim. They lift their feet high for the regulation step of the slow funeral march. But observe that even in their grim sternness, these men are quivering with an emotion which they cannot control, an emotion which passes out in magnetic waves from their ranks to those of their comrade spectators of England and Ireland, and brings tears to the eyes and choking sobs to the throats of the strong and the brave. Talk not of grief till thou hast seen the tears of warlike men. The Highland Brigade is burying its dead. In a separate grave, at the head of a long, shallow trench, the body of General Warcope is laid, in sight of, and facing the foe. The chaplain advances, and the solemn service for the dead is recited, in a clear and markedly Scotch voice, while all bow their heads, and either listen or ponder. A grief-stricken kinsman's quivering hand drops earth upon the body at the words, Ashes to ashes, dust to dust and the grave of the general is quickly filled in. There, beside the trench, already lie the corpses of fifty officers and men. They had been carried to the burial place earlier in the day. There, at the end nearer to the general's grave, the officers are laid. Beside them, their comrades of minor rank in life, all brought to a worldly level by the hand of death, are placed in the trench. It is an excavation only about three feet deep, but it is twelve feet wide, and the dead men are put feet to feet in two parallel rows, twenty-five on each side. They are fully attired, just as they were brought in from the battlefield, and each is wrapped in his blanket. The sporran is turned over on to the dead face, and the kilt thrown back, the rigid limbs showing bare and scarred in the unfilled trench. The Highland Brigade is burying its dead. Once more the chaplain steps forward, and a new funeral service is commenced. Again great powerful men weep. Some grow faint, some pray, some curse. O oh God, O oh God, is the cry which comes from bursting hearts, as comrades are recognised, and soil is sprinkled over them by hard rough hands, which tremble now, as they never trembled in the face of a foe. Then the burial parties get to work, gently, as a sweet woman tucks the bedclothes round her sleeping child. The soft soil falls kindly upon the shreds of humanity beneath. Men cease to weep, and catch something of the rapture of repose, of which a poet has sung. Mother Earth has claimed her own, and the brave are sleeping their last sleep in her kindly embrace. Again the dirge of the pipes and the sweet strains of Lochaber no more fill the evening air. The Highland Brigade is burying its dead. Meanwhile the cable has carried its budget of sad messages to the old land. There, in a wee cottage by the bonny burn side, the bereaved mother bows her aged head and says, Thy will be done. There also, the heartbroken, once wife, newly made widow, pours out the anguish of her soul as she clasps her fatherless bairn to her warm bosom. Her man comes no more, for the Highland Brigade has buried its dead. End of section. Section 15 of the Cooey Reciter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Australia's Call to Arms by John B. O'Hara, M.A. By kind permission of the author. Sons of ocean-girdled islands, where the southern billows sigh, wake, 
Arise, the dread Bologna speeds her chariot through the sky. Yea, the troubled star of danger on Britannia shineth down. Wake, arise, maintain her glory, and renown, and renown. In the hour of Britain's peril shall we falter, while the fires still are glowing on our altars from the ashes of our sires? Ho, oh, brave hearts, for Britain's honour, for the lustre of her crown. Wake, arise, maintain her glory and renown, and renown. Ye are children of a nation, ye are scions of the sires, that of old were in the vanguard of the worldwide empires. With the spirit of your fathers, with the fullness of their fame, wake, arise, maintain the honour of her name, of her name. Long to Britain may the crimson thread of kinship bind our wings, crimson thread that slowly slackens as the newer race upsprings. Sons of heroes, men of courage, that reverse could never tame. Wake, arise, maintain the glory of her name, of her name. See, the star of ancient Britain, that hath never known decline, by your valour lit up newly, with a glow of fiercer shine, o'er the burning sands of Africa, with your loyalty aflame, once again maintain the glory of her name, of her name. End of section. Section sixteen of the Cooey Reciter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Good news by Garnet Walsh. Moustaches and hair black as jet, tall and thin, with a sad kind of smile. Soft-handed, soft-voiced, but well set, a new chum in manners and a style. That's him, sir, that's him. He's been here a matter of nigh fourteen weeks, which I know by the rent in arrear. Though a gent, you can tell when he speaks, came one night about eight, hired the room without board. It's four shillings and cheap. Though I say it, and me and the broom, and good yellow soap for its keep and a widow with nine which the twins, bless their hearts, are that sturdy and bold at their tricks soon as daylight begins, even now when it's perishing cold o' mornings. And Betsy, my girl, has answered the door, sir, for you, she's so slow for her age, though a pearl when there's any long job to get through. And Bobby, but there, I forgot, you'll pardon a mother I know, well, for six weeks he paid up his shot, and then I could see funds was low. He dressed just as neat, but his coat got buttoned up nigh his chin, and the scarf twisted round his poor throat, Mr. Friend, in the shape of a pin. So the rent it run on, for, says I, he's out of his luck, I can see, and wants all his money to buy his whittles. You brat, let that be. Where he works I can't tell, but he's out every morning at nine from the house, and he comes back at six or about, and ups to his room like a mouse. On Sundays the same, so I suppose, he visits his friends on that day, but where it may be that he goes, it's not in my knowledge to say. He ain't well, I can tell by his walk. He's as thin as a lath, and that pale. But I never could get him to talk so I can't rightly guess what may ail. He never sends out for no beer, he don't smoke, and as far as I see, beyond the few clothes he brought here, and a desk, he's as hard up as me. What? You bring him good news? I am glad. A fortune? Ten thousand? Oh, la! That's the physic for you, my poor lad. This way, sir? It's not very far. Mind that stair, please. The banister's broke. Here's his door. Hush! I'll knock. Ah, asleep. Can't help it. You'd better be woke. The news is too pretty to keep. Ain't he sound, eh? Poor fellow, he's rocked to rest in the kingdom of Nod. We'd better go in. 
It's not locked. Follow me, sir. All dark. Oh, my God. End of section. Section 17 of the Cooey Reciter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Free Trade versus Protection by Garnett Walsh. Yes, they were boys together in the grand old fatherland. They fubbed at tore together, played truant hand in hand. They sucked each other's toffee, they cribbed each other's tops. They pledged eternal friendship in an ounce of acid drops. With no tie of blood between them, a greater bond was theirs, cemented by the constant swap of apples, nuts, and pears. And when to manhood they had grown, with manhood's hispered chins, they held as close together still as Siam's famous twins. And Dobbins swore by Jobbins, and Jobbins vowed that he would never break with Dobbins, whate'er their fate might be. So Jobbins came with Dobbins across the restless main, and they traded as D.J. and Co., and gained much worldly gain. Each gave the other dinners, each drank the other's health, each looked upon the other as a mine of mental wealth. And Dobbins swore by Jobbins, and Jobbins vowed that he would never break with Dobbins, whate'er their fate might be. But ah, for human nature, alas for humankind, there came a cloud between them, with a lot more clouds behind. The tariff was the demon fell which sad disruption made, for our Dobbins loved protection, while our Jobbins loved free trade. As partners now in business, they could no more agree, so they forthwith dissoluted and halved the LSD, and the fiercest opposition in every sort of way was carried on by Dobbins versus Jobbins day by day. Then Dobbins entered Parliament, and so did Jobbins too, and each upheld his principles amidst that motley crew, and the side that Dobbins voted with were victors of the hour, and Dobbins was made treasurer, while Jobbins' grapes were sour. Then Dobbins went to work with glee, protecting everything, and gave his pet proclivities the very fullest swing, set all the manger-loving dogs a-barking in his praise, and raised the tariff up kite-high, a real four aces raise, he taxed the pots, he taxed the pans, he taxed the children's mugs, he taxed the brooms, he taxed the mops, he taxed the jars and jugs. In soft and hardware every line was smothered by his dues, except the national tin tax, the ministerial screws. He taxed each article of food, each article of wear, he even taxed fresh water, and he tried to tax fresh air. He improvised new duties, new taxes by the score, and when he stopped a while to think, he taxed his brain for more. And not one blessed class of goods was entered at the port, but what he ad valoremed, till he made importers snort, till even old protectionists, grown hoary in the cause, began to change to fidgets what had started as applause. Poor Jobbin suffered hugely by his while on partner's tricks, but found it rather dangerous to kick against the pricks. He had to grin and bear it, as many a worthy man has grinned and borne it in his turn since this mad world began. Now Dobbins, flushed with fortune's smiles, his high ambition fed, bethought him that the time had come when he might safely wed. So by the wire electrical, as he had nicely planned, he sent this loving message to the grand old fatherland. Matilda, I am ready, with five thousand pounds a year, come out unto your Dobbins, love, and be his bride so dear. To which there sped the answer back that very self-same day. As soon as I have packed my things, I am coming straight away. Matilda was an heiress of the old blue Bobbins' blood. Her ancestors owned land and beeves long years before the flood. One relative, tis said, indeed, a chemist I'll engage, sold bottled protoplasm in the prehistoric age. Our Dobbins, and our Jobbins too, had loved the maid of old, but Bobbins' pair had snubbed them both for lack of needful gold. Though when the telegram arrived, Five thousand pounds a year, Pa winked a playful little wink, and said, Be off, my dear. 
the packing of her luggage was a most stupendous job she'd the miscellaneous wardrobe of the highest sort of knob new trousseau plate and furniture and presents from her friends and cockles pills and raspberry jam and various odds and ends there were eighty zinc lined cases and portmanteaus full a score of band and bonnet boxes at least some fifty more of carpet bags three dozen most plethorically crammed with nigh forgotten articles in one wild chaos jammed our venus had a transit out particularly quick a glorious transit mundi but without the usual sick till one fine day she gazed upon the far-famed austral strand one eye upon her luggage and one eye upon the land the vessel berthed beside the pier matilda's future lord the honourable dobbins stepped jauntily on board he clasped the maiden to his breast nor heeded that close by the melancholy jobbin stood with sad reproachful eye come come my love says dobbins let's get your things ashore i have a cabin waiting here to take them to my store a cab cried she twice twenty cabs would not for me suffice behold my things he started as though stung by cockatrice that lofty mountain yonder which high its head erects that alp of packing cases are those dear your effects of course they are beloved for keeping house with you enough to furnish us complete and everything quite new he staggered as if hearing news of pestilence or dearth then gasped in low and anxious tones and what's the whole lot worth she thought that his emotion spoke of joy that knew no bounds and whispered gaily in his ear some forty thousand pounds he bit his lips he ground his teeth he tore out hunks of hair he looked the full embodiment of desperate despair then with a shriek of agony the hideous truth found vent there's ad valorem on the lot of ninety-five per cent my new amended tariff comes in force this very day i little dreamt that you and i should be the first to pay besides i haven't got the cash oh dear how bad i feel the maiden smiled a scornful smile and turned upon her heel the miserable dobbins gave a second piercing shriek then leapt into the briny flood and stayed there for a week though jobbins tried to find him hard but failed with these remarks he always was too deep for me besides there might be sharks the very night of dobbins loss the ministry went out the jobbins party took their place midst many a ringing shout and of our jobbins in a trice their treasurer they made because as everybody knew he gloried in free trade he took the dues off everything from thimbles up to tanks and passed miss bobbins goods himself and won that virgin's thanks and what is more he won her hand her chattels and her heart and she is mrs jobbins now till death them twain doth part as dobbins to import his love had spared nor cash nor pains they raised a handsome monument above his cold remains the carved inscription to this day is there his tale to tell he did his duties and himself not wisely but too well end of section section eighteen of the cooey reciter this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Lion's Cubs by Garnet Walsh Patriotic Song and Chorus Australian sons are we, and the freest of the free, But love in chains is still with fetters strong To the dear old land at home, Far across the rolling foam, The little isle to which our hearts belong. It shall always be our boast, Our bumper-honoured toast, that should britain bid us help her we'll obey then if e'er the call is made and old england needs our aid these are the words australia's sons will say there is not a strong right hand throughout this southern land but will draw a sword in dear old england's cause our numbers may be few but we've loyal hearts and true and the lion's cubs have got the lion's claws from our ocean guarded strand o'er the sunny plains inland to the cloud-kissed mountain summits faint and far 
Australians bred and born, behold yon banner torn, and greet it with a lusty lunged hurrah. Tis the brave old Union Jack that nothing can beat back, ever waving where the brunt of battle lies. For each frayed and faded thread, Britain counts a hero dead, who died to gain the liberties we prize. Then there's not a strong right hand throughout this southern land, but will draw a sword in dear old England's cause. Our numbers may be few, but we've loyal hearts and true, and the lion's cubs have got the lion's claws. The ever-honoured name on the bright bead roll of fame that our fathers held through all the changing past, in it we claim our share, and by St. George we swear we can keep that name untarnished to the last. Then, when the hour arrives, we will give our very lives for the dearest land of all the lands on earth, and, foremost in the fray, show Britain's foes the way Australia's sons can prove their British birth. Yes, there's not a strong right hand throughout this southern land, but we'll draw a sword in dear old England's cause. Our numbers may be few, but we've loyal hearts and true, and the lion's cubs have got the lion's claws. Sons of the South unite in federated might, the champions of your country and your queen, from New Zealand's glacier throne to the burning torrid zone, will prove that welded steel is tough and keen. The wide world shall be shown that we mean to hold our own in the home of our adoption, free and fair. And if the lion needs, he shall see, by doughty deeds, how his austral cubs can guard their father's lair. For there's not a strong right hand throughout this southern land, but will draw a sword in dear old England's cause. Our numbers may be few, but we've loyal hearts and true, and the lion's cubs have got the lion's claws. End of section Section 19 of The Cooey Reciter This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Little Duchess by Ethel Turner The tale is as old as the Eden tree, and new as the new-cut tooth. He was the clerk of the cash tramway, and when the rolling balls gave him a moment's leisure, used to look down from his high perch at the big shop beneath his feet, and in his slow, quiet style, study the ways of the numberless assistants whose life-books thus opened to him so many of their pages. Lately there had come to the place a slight grey-eyed girl, who wore her black dress with such grace, and held her small head with such dignity, that he whimsically had named her to himself the Little Duchess. He liked to look down and catch a glint of her hair's sunshine when his brain was dulled with calculating change, and his fingers ached with shutting cash balls and dispatching them on their journeys, and he used to wonder greatly how any customer could hesitate to buy silks and satins when their lustre and sheen were displayed by her slim little fingers, and a quality descanted on with so persuasive a smile. There were handsomer girls in the shop, girls with finer figures and better features, but to the boy in his mid-air cage, there was none with the nameless dainty charms that made the little duchess so lovable. For, of course, he did love her. In less than two months he had begun to watch for her cash ball with a trembling eagerness, to smooth out and stroke gently the bill her fingers had written, and to wrap it and its change up again with a careful tenderness that no one else's change and bill received. He had spoken to her half a dozen times in all, twice at the door on leaving, weather remarks, to which she had responded graciously, once or twice about bills that she had come to rectify at the desk, and once he had had the great good fortune to find and return a handkerchief she had dropped. Such a pretty, ridiculous atom of muslin it was, with a fanciful Nelly taking up one quarter and some delicate scent lending such subtle fascination that it was a real wrench for the lad to take the handkerchief from his breast pocket and proffer it to her. So great a wrench, indeed, that he proffered his love, too, humbly, 
but fervently, and received a very wondering look from the grey eyes, a badly concealed smile, a thank you for the handkerchief, and a no thank you for the love. He had kissed her, though, and that was some consolation afterwards to his sore spirit, kissed her right upon the sweet scarlet lips, which had said no so decidedly, and then, bold no longer, had fled the shelter of the friendly packing cases and beaten a retreat to his desk aloft. That was nearly a fortnight ago. Not once since had she spoken to him, and today he was feeling desperate. It had been a very busy morning, and he had found hardly a second to raise his eyes from his work. The one time he had looked down, she had been busy with a customer, a girl prettily dressed and golden-headed like herself. That had been at about ten o'clock. Before twelve, her cash-box, with a notch upon it that his penknife had made, rolled down its line, and he opened it as he had opened it twenty times that morning. But this time it bore his fate. With the bill was a little twisted note, on which John Walters, private, was written, and the boy's very heart leapt at the sight. Down below, customers wearily waited for change, and anxiously watched for their own particular ball, while the deus ex machina read, again and again, with eager eyes, "'Please, will you meet me at lunchtime in the Strand? Do, if you can. I am in trouble.' You said you loved me. Then, as he began mechanically to manipulate the waiting balls, he looked down to the accustomed place of the little duchess. She was pale, he saw, and her lips trembled oddly now and again. There was a frightened look in her grey eyes, and once or twice he thought he noticed a sparkle as of tears. At lunchtime he actually tore through the shop and away down to the appointed place. She was there, still pale, still nervous and fluttering. "'Let us go to the gardens. It's quieter,' he said, putting a great restraint upon himself. Then, when at last they were within the gates, "'God bless you for this, Nellie.' "'What?' said the girl, with uncertainty, but not looking at the plain, rugged face that was all aglow with love for her. "'For telling me about the worry, asking me to come.' Oh, God bless you, Nelly. Now, tell me. She sat down on the seat and began to cry, quietly and miserably, until the boy was almost beside himself. At last, between the sobs, he learned her trouble, which was grave indeed. She and her sister had very much wanted to go to a certain ball, and, more than that, to have new dresses for it, of soft white liberty silk, such as she cut off daily for fortunate customers. But her purse was empty, so, in their emergency, the sisters had hit upon a plan, questionable indeed, but not dishonestly meant. The sister came to the silk counter and purchased thirty yards of silk, paying fifteen shillings for it, instead of three pounds and fifteen shillings. "'That was on account. I was only taking a little credit, like other customers.' said the little duchess, with a haughty movement of the head. On Saturday I was going to make out a bill for an imaginary customer, and send the three pound up to the desk to you. Don't imagine I would really wrong the firm by a halfpenny. Oh, no, cried the boy eagerly. It's all right. That's not all. The girl began to cry again, hopelessly, miserably. I had no money to get the dresses made and the next customer paid two pounds and ten shillings, and, and, I only sent ten shillings up to you. I wanted to make it just five pounds I had borrowed. I thought I might borrow enough, as I was borrowing. Don't forget, I would rather have died than have stolen the five pounds, Mr. Walters. Of course, of course, I understand, said the cash clerk, seeing it was a worse fix than he had imagined but longing to take her in his arms and kiss away the tears. And then that horrid Mr. Greaves, who signed first in a hurry, asked for my book, and took it for something, and then sent it up to the desk, 
and the figures are all confused. And the check-leaf isn't the same as I sent to you. I hadn't time to make it right. And when the books are compared to-night, it will be noticed, and I shall get into trouble. And, oh, I have it so miserable. The little Duchess was sobbing pitifully. He kissed her, this time in earnest, on the lips, the cheeks, the hair, the tear-wet eyes. He only recollected himself when a gardener's form, and especially his smile, obtruded themselves upon their notice, and they sat apart, looking foolish, until the two o'clock bells made them hurry back to the shop. "'I'll put everything right. Don't you worry,' he said, and she smiled relievedly and went to her counter. That afternoon he did what all the other years of his life he had deemed it impossible for him to do. He made a neat alteration in his books so that the five pounds in question would not be missed. Tomorrow, he resolved, he would take five pounds of his own and pay it into the account of the firm. The little duchess should be his debtor and run no more risks. But, alas, for the morrow. Before he had fairly taken his seat in the morning, before Nelly had finished fastening at her neck the violets he had brought her, some words were said at his elbow, and he slowly became aware that he, surely it was a dream, was being arrested for defalcations in his accounts. He learned that for some time past the firm had been aware of considerable discrepancies in the books, and had placed a detective accountant in the office. Last night, for the first time, the man had discovered, as he thought, a clue, and had convinced the firm that in Walters he had found the offender. The lad was ashen pale, horror-stricken, as he realised how these things must go against him. He could not drag in the name of the little duchess. Even if he did, it would not avail him much. He certainly had altered his books, and to mention the girl's share would only be to have two of them brought to trial, and perhaps to jail. The little duchess in jail! That hair catching the prison-yard sunshine! That slender form clad in the garments of shame! The boy drew a deep breath, gave one very wistful glance at the silk counter, and then walked straight to the manager's room, followed by the policeman. "'I took the five yesterday and brought it back to-day. On my oath before God, sir, I have never misapplied one farthing of my monies.' His voice trembled in its eagerness, the deep-set eyes gleamed, and the white lips worked. "'Your purpose, Walters?' The manager looked hard, disbelieving. Direst need. Oh, believe me, sir, I have served you three years honestly as man can serve. Yesterday I borrowed this money and brought it back this morning. Don't ruin my whole life for that one act. Your pressing need yesterday? John drew a deep breath again. I can't well tell you. Then the heads of the firm came in, indignant at their misused trust, and they scorned his story. The defalcations amounted to almost fifty pounds in all, and he had confessed to five, which had been found upon him. Of course, he and no other was the offender, and they must teach their employees a lesson. So John walked down that long shop by the side of the official, his head very erect, his face pale, and his knees shaking. All his life he would remember the glances of pity, curiosity, and disdain that met him on every side. As he passed the silk counter, the little duchess was measuring a great piece of rose-red, sheeny satin that gleamed warm and beautiful beneath her hands. She was very white, and in her eyes was a look of abject horror and entreaty. His eyes reassured her, and he passed on and out of the door. All his life he would remember that rose-red satin and its brilliant glancing lights. After the trial, Everyone thought him fortunate to get only two years, and the little Duchess, who had grown thin and old-looking in the interval, breathed freely as she read the account in the papers, and saw that her name was not even mentioned in connection with the matter. He wrote to her a loving, boyish letter, and told her she must be true to him till he came out, and that then they would be married and go away where this could never be heard of. 
It was no small thing he had done for her, he knew, and, as he was not more than human, he expected his reward. And the little Duchess had cried quietly over the letter, and for several days cut off silk and satin with a pensive, unhappy look that quite touched her customers, those few among them who realised that it was human flesh and blood at the other side of the yard measure. Twenty months later, the little Duchess was at the same counter, measuring silk and satin for the stock-taking, when a note was brought to her in a writing she remembered too well. "'I got out today, Nellie. Come down to the gardens in the lunchtime.' She hesitated when the time came, but he might come to the shop, and that would never do. So she put her hat on thoughtfully and set out for the gardens. He was awaiting her on the seat where, nearly two years ago, the gardener had smiled at them. He stood up as she came slowly towards him, and for a minute they gazed at each other without speaking. She was in black, of course, but fresh and dainty-looking, with a bunch of white chiffon at her throat, little tan shoes on her feet, and her hair showing golden against the black of her lace hat. For him, his face had altered and hardened. The once thick, curling hair was horribly short, his hands were rough and unsightly, his clothes hung awkwardly upon him, and his linen was doubtful. "'The little Duchess,' he said, dully. Then he put out his hand, took her small gloved one, and looked at it curiously. "'I'm... I'm glad you're out,' she said, carefully looking away from him. "'Yes. We must be married now, Nellie. That's all I've had to think about all this awful time.' His face flushed a little, and his eyes lightened. "'It's good not to see the walls.' he added, looking round at the spring's brave show, then away to the blue sparkle in the bay and the glancing sails. We mustn't talk of that time, though, ever, eh, Nelly? No, she said, regarding her brown shoes intently. His eye noted the smooth roundness of her cheek, the delicate pink that came and went, the turn of the white neck. Aren't you going to kiss me, Nelly? he said slowly, and he drew her a little strangely and awkwardly to him. Then she spoke. I knew it wouldn't be any use, and you'd never have any money or get a place after this. We couldn't be married on nothing, and it would only drag you down to have me, too. I'm not worthy of you. Well, little Duchess, he said softly, as she stopped and faltered. A slow smile crept over his face, and his deep-set eyes lighted up with tenderness. Not worthy, his little duchess. Then the crimson rushed into her face, and she flung up her head defiantly. I married the new shopwalker four months ago. End of section Section 20 of the Cooey Reciter this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Australia's Springtime by W. L. Lumley Tis a bright September morning, and Australia's golden spring is awakening every floweret and retouching every wing. Everywhere the yellow blossoms of the wattle are in view, even has the solemn gum tree taken on a lighter hue, and the earth is covered over with a vest of fresher green and the clear, cool air adds brightness to the beauty of the scene. Now the cockatoo's hoarse screaming, and the magpie's cheery call, sound in chorus to the music of the plashy waterfall. Overhead the deep clear azure is just flecked with snowy clouds, and the green and crimson parrots fly around in chattering crowds. Far away is all the bustle of the smoky, restless town, and the timid kangaroo upon the grass lies fearless down. Nature calmly lieth waiting, in her peaceful solitude, for the dawning of the morning, bright with hopes of future good, lies as she has lain for ages, by the white man's foot untrod, like a glorious new creation, freshly from the hand of God. Tis Australia's golden springtime, and the vision, fresh and green, of the lonely peaceful country, is a swiftly changing scene, First a few white tents embosomed mid the thickly growing trees, and the sound of human labour floating on the passing breeze. First a village, 
then a city, with an ever-swelling tide passing through its busy markets, stretching outwards far and wide. And while a growing nation overspreads the smiling land, nature opens up her treasures with a free and lavish hand. All the verdant fields are roaming, flocks and herds of sheep and kine. Deep beneath the sunlit surface works the toiler in the mine. Education and religion build their temples o'er the plain, and the iron horse moves swiftly past broad fields of golden grain, where a plenteous harvest ripens to reward the toiler's care, and each honest willing worker may obtain a rightful share. Blessed peace and glorious freedom banish far the warrior's sword. Fancy seems to gaze enraptured on a paradise restored. Tis the springtime of Australia, and the dazzled eye may see wondrous dreams of future greatness, of the glories yet to be. Visions, not of martial conquest, not of courage, blood and fire, but of lands by noble actions, growing greater, grander, higher. Of the wandering nations turning, gazing with expectant eyes, while oppressed and toiling millions feel new hopes and thoughts arise in the march of human progress as australia leads the van to the world's great federation and the parliament of man such the triumphs ay and grander that the coming days shall see if australia but be faithful to her glorious destiny with a smile of heaven upon her in the future as the past sweeping back the threatening war clouds that her sky may overcast like a stately white-winged vessel she shall keep her steadfast way peace o'er all her wide dominions ruling with unbroken sway and her progress be continued till the wings of time are furled her glorious page the brightest in the history of the world end of section section twenty one of the cooey reciter this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Man That Saved the Match by David McKee Wright By kind permission of the author Our church ain't reckoned very big, but then the township's small. I've seen the time when there were seats and elbow room for all. The women fold would come, of course, but working chaps was rare. They'd rather loaf about and smoke and take the Sunday air. But now there's hardly standing room, and you can fairly say There ain't a man we like as well as quiet Parson Gray. We blokes was great for cricket once. We'd held our own so long. In all the townships round about, our team was reckoned strong. And them that didn't used to play could barrack pretty fair. They liked the leather hunting that they didn't have to share. A team from town was coming up to teach us how to play. We meant to show what we could do upon that Christmas day. The stumps were pitched at two o'clock, but Lawson's face was grim. Lawson was captain of the team, our crack, we reckoned him. For Albert Wilson hadn't come, the safest bat of all. With no one there to take his place, he counted on a fall. Who could we get? There's no one here it's worth our while to play in place of Albert. At his side was standing Parson Gray. "'I used to wield the willow once,' the parson softly said. "'If you have no one for the tail, you might take me instead.' The captain bit his fair moustache. He seemed inclined to swear, but answered sulkily enough, "'All right, sir, I don't care. There's no one here is worth his salt with breaking balls to play.' "'I'll try and do my best for you.' said quiet Parson Gray. "'It's best,' Bill Lawson said to me. "'What's that, I'd like to know? "'To spoon an easy ball to point "'and walk back sad and slow. "'Miss every catch that comes to him "'and fumble every ball "'and lose his way about the field "'at every over call. "'The blooming team can go below "'after this Christmas day. "'I'm hanged if I'm to captain it, when parsons start to play. Bill won the toss. We went in first. I might as well say here that I'm a weary kind of bat to stick in for a year. I can't hit out, 
It ain't no use. It saddens me to think a bloke that bowled against us once has taken since to drink. He couldn't get my wicket, and his balls came in that way. I battered through the innings without a run all day. The fun began. By George, to think the way our stumps went down. Our boys was made the laughing stock for them swell blokes from town. I kept my end up, that was all. Lawson was bold first ball, and six of them went strolling back without a run at all. Nine wickets down for fourteen runs was all our score that day, when the last man came in to bat, and that was Parson Gray. The bowler with the break from leg sent down a hardish ball. I thought to see the parson squirm and hear the wicket fall. It didn't happen, for he played a pretty forward stroke. I knew that moment he could bat, that quiet preaching bloke. And when a careless ball came down, the boys began to roar. He drove it hard along the ground. We took and run a four. Then it was over. And of course, mine was a maiden one. I broke the bowler's hearts that day for just a single run. The parson played a dashing game. His cuts were clean and fine. I only wish that strokes like them could now and then be mine. He had a fifty to his name in just an hour's play. And then, well then, I run him out, I own, that Christmas day. By George, said Lawson, who'd have thought that he could bat so well? I could have gone and drowned myself when Bryant's wicket fell. But man, he must have been a bat when he was at his best. I'm glad that Wilson wasn't here, or any of the rest. Now if our chaps are on the spot, and bowl as well today, we'll give them news to carry home how country clubs can play. Our bowling always has been fair. We couldn't well complain. We got a wicket now and then. They didn't fall like rain. But runs were coming rather slow, and fifty was the score when the ninth man was given out an honest leg before. It was a single innings game, and plainly on the play, it seemed the glory would be ours upon that Christmas day. Last man! The bowling crack came in. Of course, he couldn't bat. He could lash out and chance the stroke to show us what was what. Our hopes were down to freezing point. Twelve runs were to his score. To win the match, he only had to hit another four. He swiped. We groaned to think that we were beaten after all. The stroke was high. A splendid catch. The parson held the ball. Then how we yelled and yelled again. He'd fairly won the match. The splendid batting that he showed. The more than splendid catch. Why, chaps, you'd hardly credit it that almost every bloke goes into church on Sunday now and does without his smoke, and no one's likely to forget that sunny Christmas day when we were all surprised a bit at quiet Parson Gray. End of section Section 22 of the Cooey Reciter This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Ode for Commonwealth Day First of January, nineteen o one, by George Essex Evans. Awake, arise! The wings of dawn are beating at the gates of day. The morning star hath been withdrawn. The silver vapours melt away. Rise royally, O sun, and crown the shorewood billow, streaming white, the forelands and the mountains brown with crested light. Flood with soft beams the valleys wide the mighty plains, the desert sand, till the new day hath won for bride this austral land. Free born of nations, virgin white, not won by blood, nor ringed with steel, thy throne is on a loftier height, deep-rooted in the commonweal. O thou, for whom the strong have wrought, and poets sung with souls aflame, born of long hope and patient thought, a mighty name, we pledge thee faith that shall not swerve. Our land, our lady, breathing high the thought that makes it love to serve. 
and life to die now are thy maidens linked in love who erst have striven for pride of place lifted all meaner thoughts above they greet thee one in heart and race she in whose sunlit coves of peace the navies of the world may rest and bear her wealth of snowy fleece northward and west and she whose corn and rock-hewn gold built that queen city of the south where the lone billow swept of old her harbour mouth come too thou sun maid in whose veins for ever burns the tropic fire whose cattle roam a thousand plains come with thy gold and pearls for tire and that sweet harvester who twines the tender vine and binds the sheaf and she the western queen who mines the desert reef and thou against whose flowery throne and orchards green the wave is hurled australia claimed you ye are one before the world crown her most worthy to be praised with eyes uplifted to the morn for on this day a flag is raised a triumph won a nation born and ye vast armies of the dead from mine and city plain and sea who fought and dared who toiled and bled that this might be draw round us in this hour of fate this golden harvest of thy hand with unseen lips o consecrate and bless the land eternal power benign supreme who weighest the nations upon earth without whose aid the empire dream and pride of states is nothing worth from shameless speech and vengeful deed from license veiled in freedom's name from greed of gold and scorn of creed guard thou our fame in stress of days that yet may be when hope shall rest upon the sword in welfare and adversity be with us lord end of section section 23 of the cooey reciter this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Desperate Assault From How He Kept the Flag Flying By Donald MacDonald I have more than once had reason to admire the British soldier in battle, but never was there such good ground for admiration as in watching him prepare. All the blare and tumult, the death and disaster of actual conflict, have no such tense, dramatic, nerve-trying moments as when a regiment is making ready for some great enterprise. The fight is a medley of mixed impressions, jostling each other for a moment's existence ere passing away, but the getting ready is unforgettable. Everything is clear-cut and within the sum of human emotions, eternal. So it was with that last grand charge of the Devons, which swept the Boers from their fringe of the little plateau and finished the long seventeen hours ordeal. The enemy were on one side of the table, we on the other. A tropical hailstorm howled across it, and beat heavily in our faces, as Colonel Park led his men up the sheltered face of the hill, and halted a moment within five yards of the crest, to make ready. The men knew exactly what they had to do, and the solemnity of a great and tragic undertaking was upon and about them all the world for them the too brief past with its consequences the fast-flying present and the mysterious beyond might concentrate in a short desperate dash across a storm-swept african hilltop it was the sublimity of life the anticipation of death the devons were making ready for it and how unready a man might feel at such a moment the line of brown riflemen stretched away to the left of us and it seemed that every trivial action of every man there had become an epic. One noticed, most of all, the constant moistening of the dry lips and the frequent raising of the water bottles for a last hurried mouthful. One man tightened a belt. Another brought his cartridges handier to his right hand, though he was not to use them. It was something to ease the strain of watching. Every little thing fixed itself on the mind as a photograph. There was no need of mental effort to remember. One could not see and forget, and would not, for his patriotism and his pride of kinship, forget if he could. 
then the low clinking quivering sound of the steel which died away from us in a trickle down the ranks as the bayonets were fixed and a dry harsh artificial laugh in strong contrast to the quiet of the scene everything heard easily somehow above the rush and clatter of the storm and lost only for an instant in the sudden bursts of thunder a bit of quiet tragedy wedged into the turmoil of the great play and all unspeakably solemn and awe-inspiring one must see to understand it one may have seen yet can never describe it the situation was not for ordinary language it was homeric overmastering now then devons get ready there was a dry catch in the colonel's voice as he gave the word and the short sentence was punctuated by the zip zip of the mouths of bullets that for a few precious seconds would still be flying overhead there was a quick panting of the breath a stiffening of the lines of the faces that with so many of them was but the prelude to the rigidity of death it was waiting for them only a few yards up and their manhood was being sorely tried but the devons squared their shoulders gripped their rifles bringing them up with a quick whip of the drill that was too well ground into them to be forgotten even then a prompt addressing by the left and as though eager to get it over the devon sprang forward to the word into the double storm of hail and nickel-plated bullets the killing suspense was over they were in action at last one's whole heart went with them and just for one moment as they stood fully exposed upon the plateau it seemed to the watchers that there might be disaster they had slightly miscalculated the enemy's strongest point and had to wheel by the left as they did so the line faltered for a moment a shiver a pendulum like swaying seemed to run down it that was a history-making moment when the regiment might either do something that ever afterwards they would try to forget or that all their countrymen would be proud to remember the moment in men's lives which measured by emotion only stretch out into centuries it was a moment of a life too for the commander of men his chance had come steady devons steady came the clear ringing call and then with one great surging rush that gathered momentum even as it lost in fallen units the regiment went on boldly though they had taken and held that hill prudence came to the boer riflemen as these eager bayonets bore down upon them for a moment they shot the devons through and through and then they ran at that moment not a man amongst our commonplace drinking swearing tommies but was exalted deified but so many of them were something less of interest on earth than even a common soldier where the regiment had gone seventy of its dead and wounded littered the hilltop but still it was the moment of victory not of lamentations it may sound strange to say that the prelude to a battle like the preface to a book can be greater than the actual battle or the book but so it seemed to me others might view it differently but challenge our impressions as we may in the light of riper history we shall never alter them they are indelible overhaul the plates again and again as we please it will always be the same picture end of section